The UK is a nation of islands and our technologically advanced society has been built on our country's fundamental links with the sea. More importantly, it is the coastal towns that have provided this crucial link for centuries. These towns, big and small, have been at the forefront of allowing us to trade, explore, fish, to do business and protect our nation. They provide unique opportunities, are often the catalysts for tourism, and they provide jobs that support the local economy. Looking out to the horizon, they provide a sense of freedom, as well as a sense of enjoyment, and give us a beautiful home. However, we are going to focus on one town that stands out from the hundreds that dot our coastline. One that occupies a unique spot on Britain's east coast and one that has a rich history and today is facing the challenges of the 21st century full on. This is the UK's most easterly town with a population of over 70,000. Welcome to Lowestoft. The town's best point marks the UK's most easterly point. Standing right here, the sun pokes above the horizon. You know you are one of the first people in the UK to see the beams of brightness and sunshine that herald a new day. Fish is written large in the language of Lowestoft, where the men who go down to the sea leave the shelter of the harbour to battle for their livelihood and our food. Day in and day out, these men of our fishing fleets brave the roughest of weather to gather the harvest of the sea. Lowestoft has such a rich history aided by its special location by the sea. The introduction of the railways led to a boom in its industries. There were almost 800 trawlers when the fishing industry was at its peak. With the outbreak of war, the Royal Naval Patrol Service was based north of the town and operated out of the harbour. Today, Lowestoft has moved with the times, providing employment to the energy sector and has a fundamental and influential role in oil and gas. It now plays a leading role in our nation's offshore wind power. Welcome to Britain's most easterly town. This is the story of Lowestoft, its past, present and imminently bright future. Steeped in history, Lowestoft is one of the earliest sites of human habitation in Britain, with human evidence being traced back 700,000 years. Settled during the Stone, Bronze and Iron Ages, the town consisted of around 16 households. However, it was during the Middle Ages, following the collapse of the Roman Empire, that Lowestoft started to pick up momentum as a fishing community. Herring became the primary source of income, helping the town become big enough to rival its neighbouring fishing port, Great Yarmouth. 1831 saw the construction of the Inner Harbour. This followed the completion of the Norwich to Lowestoft railway line, thanks to Samuel Morton Petto. This opened up markets further inland and promoted new industries, including engineering and shipbuilding. Not only did the construction of the railway allow Lowestoft's fishing industry to flourish, it also boosted its status as a seaside resort, with rich tourists flocking to the town to enjoy the luxurious beaches and hotels during the summer. New industries continued to grow, in particular shipbuilding, which included naval vessels. Lowestoft played a significant role during both world wars. During World War II, bombing by the Luftwaffe was intense. Notable engagements against battleships and cruisers took place off the coast during the First World War. And in the Second World War, 
motor torpedo boats and motor gunboats from Lowestoft fought pitched battles with German e-boats in the North Sea. The Royal Naval Patrol Service, based at HMS Europa, now known as Sparrow's Nest Gardens, was an important service operating armed trawlers, minesweepers and auxiliary vessels against the combat of Nazi U-boats. The evidence of both world wars is still very prominent around the town, with countless wrecks off the coast. Four attacks were carried out on Lowestoft during the First World War. Two by zeppelins, one by aircraft and one by bombardment from the sea. Five people were killed as a result. This was a small foretaste of what the town would experience in World War II. 192 civilians and 81 service personnel were killed in the Second World War. The Germans attacked Lowestoft on 105 separate occasions during the Second World War. These attacks resulted in 75% of the houses and premises in Lowestoft being affected in some way. The worst one being the infamous Waller's Raid of the 13th of January 1942, where 70 people were killed. The total number of air raid alerts in Lowestoft was an unprecedented 2,064, which was more air raid warnings than anywhere else in the United Kingdom. To put this into context, the Second World War lasted 2,075 days from start to finish. It was perceived by the Germans that Lowestoft was a really important port in both world wars. At Lowestoft stands a graceful column 50 feet high topped by a bronze model galleon. A splendid memorial to personnel of the Royal Naval Patrol Service who gave their lives during the war. Here to perform the unveiling ceremony is Admiral of the Fleet Sir Roderick MacGregor. Here too to pay their tribute are fishermen, many of whom saw active service in naval patrol boats. The memorial, which still stands today in Bellevue Park, has the names of about 2,400 who died in the patrol service without a known grave. During the war, these roads were covered in anti-tank traps. You can still see where they've been covered today, with the trails of tarmac. The ravine bridge was fitted with explosive charges to destroy it in the event of an invasion. The threat of invasion was so high that they had to cover every possible landing site and as such, the town was covered in coastal defence batteries, tank traps, barbed wire and bunkers. Lowestoft's position made it particularly vulnerable to invasion by the Axis powers and its defence was by no means taken lightly. Typically, people look to the harbour and docks in search of the history of the fishing industry. However, something closer to the high street is hiding away. Not only is the historic high street home to the core history of the town, but it also provides a link to the lower stuffed scores, narrow pathways that run all the way down to the coast. Rachel Harrison, the project coordinator for the preservation work being undertaken on the Scores, tells us more about what has been going on. The Lowestoft Scores project has been looking at the 11 existing scores around Lowestoft. Um, here we've been looking at uh, and making some improvements um, by conservation training, repairing some of the scores where it's been left to deteriorate and decay. Um, we've had a volunteer group full from our conservation training research activities where we've been doing litter picking, uh, weeding and some small repairs. I'm a local person, I've always lived in Lowestoft, so the history of my town is very important to me. I'm a quite recently retired primary school teacher and we used to bring our children that we worked with on scores walks to give them a little bit about the history of the area. Though I'm not an expert by any means, I know that this area has got a really uh, rich history, so I feel it should be preserved and brought to the attention of more people.
So the arch was restored late this spring. It was becoming quite damaged by plant growth. There was ivy growing, getting into it. And so it became unsafe and they had to close the highway. And a lot of people were quite disappointed by that. So Rachel, the Scores Project, was able to get Century Training to come in and they repaired it for us. And they completely dismantled it and reassembled it. So this is the last um, of the original um, serpentine crinkle crankle walls uh, that you can see here. So we're literally standing where this photograph was taken, um, looking up this gore. All the, uh, sorry, no, it wasn't that side. All of this side was the garden. There was a big market garden here. And um, the score, Maltster score, which is now dog legs, um, probably, um, again, looking at the records, Maltster score, not by name, but it did certainly exist in the 17th century and came straight down the cliff. Um, it looks as if whoever laid out this garden here encroached on the score and had it diverted around the property yeah. and of course it continued at one time back there as well so um, that's gone um, as well but so it's still got the crinkle crankle um, this, this is the original yeah. here I, th um, I they've think they've put some newer bits um, further along do you all know the or do you the reason for crinkle crankle walls the strength, strength of them yeah. if you put a solid um, upright wall, every so often you need buttresses. The Lowestoft scores certainly are a piece of hidden heritage left in Lowestoft, with 11 still remaining. They all have their own story beyond each score, and are certainly worth a visit from anyone exploring the historic High Street area in North Lowestoft. Even before the war, the fishing industry here in Lowestoft caught the attention of the government, who saw an opportunity to use it as a base for research and experiments in what is now marine biology. In 1902, the Marine Biological Association opened a new substation in Pakefield. Its aim was to research the fishing industry and what better place than a thriving fishing town. Early research focused on marine biology of the North Sea. However, later, the theory of fishing had been developed to a point where fish stocks were being forecasted as routine. The Government Executive Agency, previously known as the Directorate of Fisheries Research, was changed to its current name, CFAS. The Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science in 1997. It is now focused on investigating both radioactive and non-radioactive contamination at sea from its research laboratory at Pakefield. We were invited on board the CFAS Endeavour while it was moored up in Lowestoft. We were also shown around the brand new headquarters and recently refurbished labs. As during 2019, a multi-million pound refurbishment and overhaul took place. So I'm the uh, monitoring group manager here at CFAS. I've got a number of teams in my group. Um, they range from uh, some of the survey teams, through to the marine litter team that I think you might be meeting a little bit later on. Um, I also have an ecosystem science team um, and they're looking at um, various kind of interactions within the ecosystem, so trophic dynamics, that kind of thing. 
Um, and I also have a fisheries information and analysis team. Um, and they're doing quite a lot of spatial analysis. There's so much history um, in Lowestoft, particularly around the fishing industry, and that's certainly the um, aspects that this laboratory's got the most history around. But of course, things change over time. Um, so our remit as an organisation has really moved beyond just the fisheries element of, of the science that we do. And we're looking really at the environment as a whole, really, the marine environment as a whole. So we've got a lot of um, new pressures that are coming um, about, so we look at water quality issues and that does include the litter element. Um, but there's also emerging pressures such as underwater noise, um, which is something that we're looking into as well. So whilst we are developing um, further the, the bread and butter that was our history, um, and that really did start off fundamentally with fisheries, um, there's far more breadth to the, the work that we do, certainly within my group's activities, which is around monitoring. You know, the monitoring remit is just expanding with time, really. I'm Freya, I'm Hydrocarbons Laboratory Analyst. What we do in Hydrocarbons is analyse uh, marine environmental samples for compounds called PAHs, which are toxic, possibly carcinogenic compounds that we don't really want in the marine environment. An average day would be entirely lab-based, and it would probably take up the whole day. Um, Analysing for PAHs is kind of a two-day process. We can split it into um, extractions and cleanups. I always knew I wanted to be involved in science. I didn't quite know to what extent or what sort of area of science, and I just kind of took every day as it comes, went to study chemistry, and fell in love with environmental chemistry. I never thought I'd be doing science here in Lowestoft. Growing up uh, near CFAS, no one really knew what happened behind those doors, it was a bit of an enigma, uh, but having worked here I've realised that it's such a great place to do cutting edge international science and I think that there's a lot of good things to come. I've been adopted somewhat, I suppose, by the Marine Litter team during my time at CFAS, which has given me an opportunity to work not just here in Lowestoft, but internationally across three different continents. I've spent time in Belize and South Africa and doing science that is not only interesting but beneficial and I think is going to be making a difference for, for many years and generations to come. So of course um, science is best fueled by collaboration and collaboration works best when working with a team of diverse um, minds uh, from different places that can offer different things. Um, having grown up near the sea, uh, without wanting to sound dramatic, I've always felt a certain responsibility for helping to maintain its sustainability and its health and I think it's important to um, to do so and if I can then I then I will with Lowestoft's rich history there are others who are keen to tell its story this includes local people who took part in the heritage open days where they organized events for a hugely successful two weeks a large number of buildings opened up their doors and gave the public a chance to have a look around and explore their history, ranging from the historic Town Hall, Royal Yacht Club, and Port House. There was a huge amount of history on show. The Heritage Open Days saw an estimated 20,000 visitors in 2019. We're here in the Port House in Lowestoft, which was built in 1831 as part of the Heritage Open Days Festival in Lowestoft. Uh, it's a great event um, out of over 800,000 cities taking part in the UK or well, in England. Uh, we rank about number 10, so it, heritage in Lowestoft is just so important and it's really, really popular here. Um, we've got over 85 events and sites and buildings open this year um, and it, it's something that's just growing in the town. People love it. We get up to 10,000 visits at the various properties and events that, that go on. During the open days, Joshua went on board the Excelsior to interview a crew member who told us 
what the Excelsior Trust does. Excelsior was built in 1921. She is a smack a fishing ship, fishing boat. Uh, she was one of 300 fishing smacks that were fishing out of Lois Tuft at the time. After having fished in Lois Tuft, she was sold to a Norwegian guy who used her in Norway to transport cargo between Norwegian islands. And she stayed in Norway for a long time until she was rediscovered in the 70s uh, by John Wilson a local Lois Tuft architect who had a tremendous interest in the fishing history of Lois Tuft and who saw Excelsior in Norway and recognized her for what she had been when she was in Lois Tuft, even though at this point she had been changed quite a lot. The masts had been cut down in size and a massive engine had been put in. He bought her and managed to get her back to Lois Tuft where he restored her with the help of local craftsmen and young people. And then what the Excelsior Trust has done since then is run her as a cell training ship. We use her to take young people aged 14 to 25 on week-long trips um, down the English coasts, um, across to Holland, Germany, uh, France, um, even up to Scandinavia. Um, we do work both with local schools and with various um, organizations that work with disadvantaged young people. And that is at the core of what the Excelsior Trust does. And then in addition to that, every year we have adult charters as well. So if you're an adult who wants to go sailing with a 100 year old uh, fishing smack, um, then that is something that we can, we can do as well. During the cultural event, stories were discovered that very few people knew, like the story about Sir Michael Caine. In early 1954, Michael was looking through the pages of Stage magazine when he saw an advert for experienced juveniles for a Lowestoft Arcadia Theatre, where the East Coast Cinema is today. The company producer, one Jackson Stanley, was bemused by Michael's CV as he has elaborated his roles. Michael has fond memories of working on the stage in Lowestoft. He describes Arcadia as a beautiful theatre. He remembers Jackson Stanley as a good producer and teaching him acting techniques that stayed with him throughout his entire acting career. 2019 was an exceptionally busy year for Lowestoft with lots of exciting events having taken place. During their autumn 2019 touring show of Pearls from the Grit, Dean spared a moment to talk to us. So the Grit project uh, started in early 2018 and it was basically a year-long project celebrating Lowestoft's uh, lost fishing village. So um, we had a Grit gathering at Christchurch Halls in January 2018. Uh, we had um, we, had, we did workshops in schools, uh, residential homes, and we were, we were gathering sort of material to, 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 to make the, the show, Pearls from the Grit. And in between, we also did the Grit Fest Celebration Day at Sparrows Nest Park in May 2018. Um, and so the show, the first pilot run of the show, uh, took place autumn 2018. Um, Basically, the Grit is Lowestoft's sort of lost fishing village. In the in, uh, early 1900s, it was home to 2,500 people, uh, four churches, schools, shops, and famously, uh, 13 pubs. Um, so, um, and what happened is it was built upon the success of the herring industry. That it was basically where all the fishermen and their family lived, um, families lived. And, and, and so, more or less, they, 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 they were sort of looked down upon by the rest of the town. Um, and I've got a line in the show that says, um, they looked down on us, so we didn't bother looking up. And there was definitely that spirit uh, of independence amongst them, because there was, there was basically, they didn't need to go anywhere else. That, that, that's where they lived, that's where they worked, that's where they shopped. And, um, and, but there was a special 
uh, characteristic, a sort of uh, uh, independent spirit amongst them. Um, and as the 20th century uh, went on and the fishing, uh, there was overfishing and the fishing declined in the, in the 20s and 30s and then the Second World War, the fishing village took a lot of damage during the Second World War with, with bombing raids. Um, and then there was a f big 53 flood, a lot of families left then. And by that time, it was in a bit of a sorry state. There were still some lovely houses down, there's some good houses down there, but a lot of them had fallen into a state of disrepair. And then in the 1960s, um, it was cleared away. Um, and it really was cleared away. There was always rumours they were going to leave a few. Um, basically, the entire east side of Waplow Road was swept away in the late 60s. Um, so that must have been quite um, difficult for for, for people who, who knew the place and and and, and so when we did uh, the sort of source of all this of all of all the grit project and pearls from the grit is a book uh, the grit story of Los Dos Beach Village which I wrote with uh, co-wrote with Jack Rose in the mid 1990s and what we did was um, Jack was uh, his nickname was Mr Los Dos um, he was a fisherman a lifeboatman quoting from the show now, comes from a family who lived on the grit for generations and uh, he used to do slideshows that filled the marina, filled Sparrow's Nest Theatre as well um, and uh, he, was a, he was a legend. Lowestoft has its fair share of natural beauty. However, not all of it is at the coast. Located near Alton Broad is Carlton Marshes as a site of special scientific interest, it is hugely rich in animals, insects and plants which form an area of marshland that is truly alive. We've come to talk to the team at Suffolk Wildlife Trust's Carlton Marshes Reserve as the 2019-20 season saw some exciting developments for them. Hi, I'm Katie Runacres. I'm a wild learning officer at Carlton Marshes Nature Reserve. We're a Suffolk Wildlife Trust Nature Reserve. We are lucky enough to have um, our new habitat creation happening here in 2020 and also our visitor centre being built. It will be completed soon in the summer. We're really excited to have this and hopefully it will be fantastic for the local community. So even if a family wants to come down and use our playscape or a couple wants to pop in and have a cup of tea in the winter, they can still enjoy the lovely views here. If an older couple wants to pop down and do a nice long walk, they can do. And generally, if people just want to come and have a moment in nature, they can just come and enjoy it. And it's a place for everyone to be included and to be part of. I'm Ellen and I'm the Broads Warden here at Carlton Marshes and at Carlton Marshes because of the Heritage Lottery Fund um, we've been able to buy 400 more acres of land so we now have a thousand acres of nature reserve in the Waveney Valley and with this 400 acres um, at Carlton Marshes um, part of it which is just here behind me we've been able to create um, more habitat for wildlife locally so we've been able to well, we're on the process of creating um, reed beds and also grazing marshes. Um, the sort of the wildlife species that we're going to be able to help protect with this new land include lapwing and red shank, abset, um, different breeding waders, and then in the, in the reed bed areas, hopefully in the future we might have bittern breeding here, um, marsh harrier, hopefully um, bearded tits, and maybe one day even cranes. Um, which would be very exciting. Um, other wildlife we have here includes um, a water vole and otters, and we have a huge um, range of butterfly and dragonfly species, which are all going to be um, helped by this new um, this new land that we've got, Carlton Marshes. In early 2020, an exciting new redevelopment started taking place in North Lowestoft. Richard Best spoke to us about how this development came about. I'm Richard Best, I'm the Suffolk Communities Project Manager 
and I'm one of the partners working on this Nest Park development. The Ness here is the most easterly park in the UK and it's being supported through the funding that we've secured through the Coastal Community Funds for nearly a million pounds and topped up with the Community Interest Levy Fund. That's enabled us to regenerate this park and celebrate the history of the park and Lowestoft which dates back to the 17th century. The conflicts that took place on the site leading up to World War II and the infamous fishing industry that once thrived in Lowestoft over a hundred years ago. Everything here celebrates the connection to the North Sea behind us and the park has been regenerated to demonstrate the connectivity now and in the past. So the investment will ensure and secure, as you can see across the park, there will be a large play park area which represents the historic fishing industry with some of the play equipment. There's a vast picnic area and benching. We have a performance space behind. There's a rope walk across the site, which demonstrates the rope making activity that took place on the site decades ago. There's a liver reduction trench, which is where the innards of the fish were discarded, rotted down to produce cod liver oil, and this got um, exported all over the world. We're demonstrating some of this history through a augmented reality presentation that will show the vast connectivity of the site and all the various um, industries that it's supported over the decades. Leading up to the top edge of the site, we have a very impressive footbridge which is going to connect the Ness Park to the sea wall and to Ness Point, so the whole site is connected from here down to South Lowestoft. This park ultimately is an absolute celebration of the communities that have lived, thrived and worked here over many, many generations and centuries and it absolutely depicts the resilience of the lowest of people to keep transforming and changing itself to suit modern times as we move forward. So the Heritage Action Zone is a partnership uh, led by Historic England and East Suffolk Council and a number of other local organisations. So the, part, the aim of the partnership is to really drive forward regeneration in the high streets, Wapplow Road and the scores, using its heritage as that catalyst. We have some wonderful buildings around Lowestoft, around this conservation area, including Bellevue Park and, and Sparrow's Nest, that we really need to kind of shine a light on. So we're kind of using heritage as a way of kick-starting that revival in Lowestoft. So, Part of the programme is working with landowners to kind of really take responsibility uh, for, for the buildings that they own and try to find a solution for those empty buildings as well. Uh, Recognising that in the high street we have some empty shops, uh, empty units. So it's actually how can we actually build those spaces and, and give them a sense of purpose again. So we're working with Historic England to bring forward some funding and um, to um, to look at feasibility studies for those buildings, looking at doing uh, condition surveys, just to understand how to bring those buildings back into use. A programme within the house is the Town Hall. The Town Hall is an important civic building for the town, uh, so our ambition is, through the partnership led, this case by the Lowestoft Town Council, is to look at bringing that back into, uh, back into use and uh, finding a purpose for it. And one of those purposes is actually looking to become a community uh, use facility where young people can meet, old people can meet, you know, they can do activities, creative activities, uh, potentially become a, a wedding venue. But what we need to, to do first is to get some funding in to build up that case. And we were lucky enough to get some funding for our Architectural Heritage Fund to do a business case, which will then hopefully lead forward to bring in further investment into the town hall. So the Heritage Action Zone has a very important story to tell in regards to its importance. You know, it was old Lowestoft with the former beach village, with the historic um, pathways known locally as the schools that connected the historic high street down to the former beach village. And we're lucky enough now, obviously, through the, through the investment, obviously, to have Nest Park which is part of, kind of like our Green Spaces kind of programme of works within the Heritage Action Zone, which includes the Nest, but also includes Bellevue Park 
and, and sparrow's nest. Importantly, it has a strong kind of story that feeds through through the work that we're doing in regards to, you know, is where old Lowestoft was. Obviously, we have kind of merchant buildings on the high street. We also have kind of the former beach village um, down at, by where the nest is now. Um, and it's really important for us to kind of make sure that connectivity is still there to try to tell a story so people can like go around the high street, go around what played road and really understand the narrative that we're trying to trying to tell. And so people, you know, I live, I'm born and bred in Lowestoft, but obviously I wasn't from the beach village. But for, for me, obviously with, with Lowestoft and the heritage that we're presenting, it feels like I'm still connected to the place because we're retelling those stories. So we're hoping obviously through kind of the Heritage Action Zone and the work that we're doing with Heritage Open Days and working with the community groups through most easily community group that actually we'll be able to bring forward those, 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 those histories, those stories, those oral histories again uh, through the programme. More recently, Lowestoft has been taking a new approach, launching itself into the renewable energy sector and becoming the hub of offshore renewable energy in the east, creating hundreds of jobs and opportunities for the town. This new industry has seen rapid development and investment in the town, including the construction of a new maintenance and operations base and quayside facilities for crew transfer vessels and wind farm engineering. Now, the port of Lowestoft has emerged as the east of England's renewable energy hub, and the operators of Lowestoft's port, the associated British ports, have a master plan for the future of our port, leading to 2035. Tom Dewitt, operations manager of the port of Lowestoft, told us about the future plans for our port. If we were to fast forward 10 years, I would expect to see Lowestoft as a centre of excellence for the offshore energy sector. That's not just the offshore wind sector, but oil and gas as well. The oil and gas sector has a number of fields in the SNS sector, the Southern North Sea, that will continue to produce for decades to come. Then we also have the decommissioning side of things that represents a significant opportunity for Lowestoft. I see the port supporting major infrastructure projects in addition, um, the likes of HS2 which has recently been announced and potentially Sizewell C as well and those would link in with the rail sidings that Network Rail have just upgraded. The other side I see the traditional industries such as fishing potentially thriving, they have a opportunity on their hands now that the UK will will exit from Europe and finally as I mentioned at the start effective infrastructure and ports go hand in hand so I see Lowestoft port becoming better connected not just via the rail sidings but also with the construction we hope of the third crossing. When the port of Lowestoft was built it created two harbour areas the inner harbour and the outer harbour. With Lake Lothing running through the centre of the town, this created the need for a bridge. Vessels regularly transit through, accessing key port facilities inland and the gateway to the broads. However, the bridge is also home to two major roads, effectively linking the A12 from London to the A47 to Norwich and providing a connection for the two halves of the town. When the bridge goes up, the traffic is stopped and the town comes to a standstill. This has for years caused conflict and frustrations amongst the locals, with two bridges deemed not enough. The necessity for another bridge has long been discussed, however this may finally be happening with the third crossing project. I think it will bring enormous benefits to the town. I think the first obvious one is 
quite low stopped unfortunately over the years has got um, people have coupled it with sitting in traffic jams people don't come to the town they don't go to the town center and people don't set up businesses here don't expand their businesses here because the perception they'll be sitting in a traffic jam and that's that is a cloud that's been hanging over the town center of the town for a long long time and the third crossing will help dispel that that uh, that cloud and will, i think give an opportunity the government investment will hopefully pave the way for private investment by businesses moving in expanding in the town and moving into the town and so i think that that will be a big benefit there are other intangible benefits which i think we will see i think there is also perhaps over the years and i've had people who've gone back over a hundred years they say we've been waiting for the third crossing and perhaps a feeling has built up over that time that the people in westminster the people in ipswich they don't care about us, they've forgotten about us. And I think we can hopefully dispel that with, the, as I said, this significant investment that, we're, that is being made. And I think coming where we are now, it can act as a catalyst for it, not only that inward investment that I've talked about, but also for people feeling good feeling proud about their town. We've, I've seen the plans that are drawing, this being drawn up. This isn't just any old bridge, it's a unique design. And I think that will be the sort of focal point for unleashing a whole raft of, it, of investment on the public sector side with the flood defence project. You also got investment um, coming forward in through the, the Towns Fund and the Places Board up to £25 million. That follows on from the investment that has been made in CFAS's new headquarters, which is shortly to be completed, and also, as was completed last year, the new energy um, campus and energy building at East Coast College. So I think it is we can, and obviously with COVID 19 as well, this can help us give the start of a very exciting future for the town. The town centre in Lowestoft is probably the second most talked about subject for residents after the debate about the third crossing. Dan Portress, the manager of the Britain Centre and chairman of Lowestoft Vision, took a moment to talk to Joshua about its future. Lowestoft Vision works closely with the council and we're trying to come up with ideas to make the town centre more inviting. Uh, our main concerns for the under slow star vision is to make the town more secure, which we do through providing a PCSO, part funding that, and also we do the radio scheme for the town center itself, which communicates between all the shops in the town so that it can uh, keep track of any issues that are going on. Uh, we also try to make the town more attractive, and the way we've done that in the past and in the future is by putting up the plantings and, and, and getting those up, trying to work with Lowestoft and Balloon to try and uh, make it more enticing, using their inputs because they provide the, the inputs that are required to, to make it more inviting. They know how to make a nice decoration. We also provide the Christmas lights that we put on every year. Uh, Lowestoft Vision provides the lightings. We've just changed out the lightings last, last year, and so we're hoping that makes it, spreads it out a little further, connecting uh, the, the main shopping precinct with the High Street area, along with down in the Bevan Street Station Square area. Um, to make it more appealing, we have put on several events throughout the year. We have the, the Christmas light switch on, as I've already mentioned. We also had last year the Lowestoft in Motion, which is the main event that we put on during the summertime. We have the Freddy the Fish um, Freddy the Fish Trail that we put on every year, which is a very family orientated so that the people can come along through the town center, searching out to find the different locations of Freddy the Fish or his friends. And uh, it just makes for a nice family orientated uh, opportunity for them to see what Lostoff has to offer. Lostoff has a lot to offer, it still has a lot to offer, although we are changing. Uh, as all town centers are, the town centers themselves are changing, so we're trying to adapt to those changes. 
Uh, we're, we, to be more influential, we're, we sit on a lot of the boards with the, the council. Uh, we're working on a master plan for the town right now to find out, to figure out a better plan for laying it out, for uh, looking at making it into four different sections perhaps, uh, one being a, a shopping precinct area, another one for being innovation. Uh, we also have the historic high street, which has become, uh, we've got, Lostoff has two historic high, high street areas. We have one up in the old town, part of town, and we've got a new one, which is just developed down on Station Square, working south. So all these things are going on. We are also sitting on boards for the third crossing, coming up with the, uh, the, the flood defense plans lots and lots of things that we're working on to try and make Lowstoff more appealing not only for for people to come into and visit but also for businesses because we have to attract businesses that's what we're dealing with now is how to attract businesses into the area the town once boasted numerous glamorous Victorian hotels along the seafront making the town a true prime destination for rich holidaymakers during the Victorian and Edwardian period. Much evidence still exists today, including the Hotel Victoria, Empire Hotel and the Grand Hotel. These combined with the Grade II listed terrace houses and the former reading room on the South Pier, Lowestoft was very much the Brighton of Suffolk. Even during the war, people made the most of the summers, despite the beaches and promenades being covered in defences. Kensington Gardens and the bowling greens, even to this day, continue to be a beautiful spot on the cliff top with wonderful views of the sea. Today, people visit Lowestoft for a variety of reasons. Many still enjoy it for the traditional seaside resort that it is. However, many visit for the history and its museums. To visit the parks, enjoy Alton Broad and the Broads National Park. A range of sailing and yacht clubs are based in Lowestoft and river cruises operate throughout the year. There is also now something much bigger to encourage visitors from afar to come to Lowestoft for a hugely popular, unique cultural event. of some work we were doing looking at how the seafront could really change and how why would people come to a place like Lowestoft like they did in the 1920s and we looked at other places around the country we looked at places like Hastings and Margate Western Supermare they had gone through a real revival uh, because they've been able to to put on something interesting for nearby cities. So Western Supermare, its nearest city is Bristol, Margate, London. And at one of the events, somebody came, came up with the idea of a, of a festival 
which is based around what only Lowestoft can do, which is to be the first place to see the sun in midsummer. So the longest day of the year, Lowestoft is the first place to see the sun. And what we were really interested in is the fact that it would celebrate this incredible beach on the South Beach, which I'm biased because I live here, but it's beautiful. I don't know if there is a better beach for a very long way. And it's uh, in the, you know, the right light, in that morning light, it's absolutely stunning. So we thought that if we put a festival on there and you got the content right, and you made it something which was going to appeal to a slightly different demographic, that we might be able to attract in people who just never come to Lowestoft. Because we know that there's a group of people who come to Lowestoft and they know what it offers, and they come to the beach, and they're very welcome. And we hope they keep coming back. But we know there's three times as many, maybe four times as many people who've never been to Lowestoft, but live within a 30 or 40 mile distance. So, yeah, we put the festival on and it was really interesting because after the festival we asked people, have you been to Lowestoft before and would you come back? And 35% of the people who went to the festival, and we asked one and a half thousand of them, 35% of the people who went to the festival had never been to Lowestoft before. And 98% of them said, based on the festival, they would come back, which was amazing because that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted to open people's eyes, people who'd never seen Lowestoft at its very best, and they saw it at its very best, uh, and open their eyes to the fact that you can come to Lowestoft and it's a stunning place, and it's a friendly place, and it's a place with life and vibrancy. The feedback was so positive, it was just like this outpouring of love for the place, and that's really what we wanted to, to achieve. What would we like it to be in the future? Who knows? I mean, this whole thing's been really organic, but we would love it if that festival became completely synonymous with Lowestoft. And it was an opportunity to show off what Lowestoft has. It was an opportunity to invite people in, not just from all over the country, but from all over the world. There were people there from all over the world. People there from Holland last year who'd heard about it. And they come, and I hope they come again. But where the festival goes will depend on lots of different things. Uh, but mainly it will depend on the energy of people in the town. And uh, based on last year, then I think we can be really confident. Because actually what happened was people just were constantly coming out and saying, I've got an idea for this. You came out with this idea for this film. You know, it was a catalyst for so many different things, musically, artistically. Um, yeah, I think it made us all believe in ourselves again. It made us believe in the town again. And it's part of, it's a symbol of what's happening to this town. You know, this town's like a phoenix rising from some tough times. And the festival's a celebration of exactly why that should happen and why it should happen now. So, yeah, we'll see. I'll be there. <laughs> and I think, we hope thousands of people will join us again next year. We kind of gave permission and we gave a forum for people to do what was already within them and, uh, and to do what was already within the town. Didn't have to ship that in, you know, it came from here. For me, away from, you know, my council job, it was hugely affirming, it was hugely affirming. I've got children who I bring up in Lowestoft and I'm pleased to do so, I'm proud to do so, and they were proud. Uh, so yeah. It achieved so much more than we thought it would as a council. What we'd hoped this year is more people come. So we think 30,000 people came last year, maybe 40,000 or 50,000 will come this year. We hope they stay for a bit longer, and we hope they come back a bit more often. So there you have it. I'm Joshua Fremantle, the director of Life and Livestock, and back in June 2019, I set out to create this very documentary you are watching now. It's been about highlighting some of the town's rich culture, as well as highlighting and celebrating some of the town's most important moments in history. Life of Liasoft from the very start was all about telling the well-deserved story for Britain's most easily town. This has been the Life of Liasoft. Goodbye for now.
This is East Suffolk One. From the East Suffolk One news desk. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, last night laid out strict new curbs on life in the UK to slow down the spread of coronavirus. Under the new restrictions, citizens can only leave home to shop for basic necessities, for one form of exercise a day, for any medical need or caring for a vulnerable person, and for travelling to and from work. Good morning everyone, so my name is Rachel Tucker and I work for East Suffolk Communities Team. It is Monday the 4th of May 2020 and I'm just about to arrive for work. So this is the largest office in Riverside that we're working from. We started the first week out in, uh, well I did, in my dining room but things got so big as you can imagine that we've moved to the Riverside building. We're all adhering to um, social distancing, so much so that uh, we have Phil Ave sits here from Lowestoft Rising, and then the next spot taken up is Louise Thomas, who's my support officer for Lowestoft. So we've had um, a massive amount of help across Lowestoft from all kinds of different organisations. Just to give you an example, the churches themselves uh, have been really good. Um, the Lowestoft Community Church, which runs the food bank, uh, has really helped support that and we've moved that onto the seafront to allow people to be able to access the food bank more easily. Um, other church groups have been helping in all kinds of ways with their own communities, including helping to do shopping and welfare visits. Uh, the Salvation Army, both North and South, have been doing food uh, at lunch times for various people who are vulnerable, which has been great. So we've seen a whole range of church groups pulling together. Um, we've then seen the supermarkets working with us, some supermarkets giving us food to help supplement the government boxes, others being able to give us um, access to their stores. <laughs> Thank you. 